yes, we all want profitable businesses, but sometimes I think you've got to incentivize your team in such a way that if it costs you a little mm. in the short term, then it makes you more in the long term. And that's kind of, as I say, my haphazard approach to running and building my team. There was a lot of people jumping on, a lot of board hairdressers and barbers starting to do a bit of haircutting courses on, on webinars themselves. Does it work? Uh, I, I found I thought it was brilliant. My manager at the time was hosting the whole thing via his house where he lived down in Herefordshire. And then I was in my salon with my iPhone and everything come to me. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I had him in my ears while you were watching me cutting hair and questions were being posted to him. The whole thing was really interactive. Mm. And towards the end of it, I definitely think that we... We were reaching audiences of 80 to 100 plus a time. If we were going to do a set of pictures for a competition, what would you what would you allocate as a budget? If, even if you're using your mate's rates and your buddy's photographer and all that kind of stuff, there's still a there's still a cost to it. And I'm always spoke, I, I'm always speaking to people who really are interested as to how they fund something like that. I the most expensive one I've done was five thousand pounds. The cheapest one I've done was seven hundred. 750 quid. And all went through the competition line? Um, yeah, yeah, well. Did the five grand do better than the 700 quid? <laughs> um, no, because we never, we, we never won any of them. No. Um, <laughs> Welcome to The Noble Barber. This is a podcast for barbers by barbers, cutting through the crap of the industry. We all want to know how our businesses can run better. I want to talk to people who've done it, messed it up, and got it right second time round, and can tell us the way that you and I can make our businesses better. You started saying, I opened my first store in 91, and I saw you did the same. Well, I started saving my apprenticeship in 91. I started my first store in 96. Oh, okay. And how, mu around the while. how much of that's been education-based, are you? Um, well, I've taught on my own team from day one. Because um, starting at 21, I did find that interviewing barbers that were older than me. They didn't want to work for a bit of a kid. Mm. So it was easier to take apprentices on at 16, 17, and they were always then younger than me. So that helped um, me sort of build my team the way I wanted as well. And in fairness, I've kept that flow going to present day, albeit I have found that this year is the first year we've actually struggled getting apprentices. So apprentices kind of straight from school, that, 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 yeah. that youth? Yeah. We, well, because we, people aren't coming into the industry so much? or um, I don't know. I've been in a lot of forums over the last few years where people have said that they struggle getting apprentices. And I've always found it very easy. So yeah. when people are starting to talk about how difficult it is attracting talent into the industry. I've never had that problem. And as I say, this is the first year where we've really struggled. We've only had two candidates so far. Wow. So, and normally by now, we've, by the end of September, we've took a couple on and they've started. And, Running them through. Yeah. How long do you run your apprenticeship for? Um, well, they go to college for 12 months. And within that time, if, if they achieve the level two within that time, great. Um, and by then, ideally, we'd like them on the level three. So it's a two-year apprenticeship. Okay. But some of them, with COVID and things, some of them struggle to mm. get through that, the last intake that we have. And do you work with the same college? Are you pleased with the college? Or are you, are, you, are you doing most of the training yourself and then just kind of they're doing the college to get the qualification, the MVQ? We do, do they give much back? No, we do most of our training ourselves. And um, we struggle with college. Um, however, from a theoretical point of view, they do perform okay. quite well. But up until six years ago, we were our own training provider. Um, but legislation changes and everything else has made it really difficult. So we've gone back to classic colleges mm. and we have struggled with working with them. Yeah. It does seem to be a recurring theme, I think, with the 
with the college side of things. And are you do you find do you do a lot of training ongoing with the, your existing staff that you've got? Yeah, um, one of the big things that I am keen on is that twice a year we have one to one sessions where the start of every year we sit down and they tell me what they want to achieve in the next 12 months. Then halfway through the year, we have another sit down where I take them for half a day and we go through exactly what they have achieved. If they're anywhere near their own goals and if they're not, and what we can do then between that point and the end of the year to get them back on track if needed. And then we have one-to-ones on, we have a staff meeting every week to inform everybody where somebody's up to and where they're going um, and to touch base with what we expect from the shop side of things, from the business and, side and of things. And is that different between, because I know you, you, you've got the two diff, quite different stores. Does the, does the training aspect apply across both? Yeah, the philosophy is the same. No. It's, only, it's only different. The difference is in our stores because a man on the street. Man on the street expect barbers to go hair short. Attitude Men's Hair was created based around the attitude of people. Right. Um, and I was flying all over the world at that point competing as a competitive hairdresser for the National Hairdressers Federation. And one day a model of mine left the shop and he bumped into one of his pals and he asked him who cut his hair. And when he told him that I had, he was like, well, he's just a barber. Can't do that. Yeah. So that was what then inspired me to open Attitude because I did believe that there was two types of guy that walked the road. And if you're if with the people you're recruiting at the moment, or you know, if you look across your team, have they all come through the kind of traditional barber route, or have you got hairdressers that have retrained more as a barber? No, they're all barbers. They're all every single member of my team has been trained by us in the ways that we work, and the longest serving member of my team's now been with us twenty three years. Wow. Okay. I mean, I was chatting earlier with Dan about um, you know coming round to the idea that it's really big part of recruitment is keeping the staff that you've keeping the team that you've got you know you don't need to recruit if people aren't leaving which sounds like you've cracked that one quite well um but is that something that was always part of your philosophy or as you grew did you find it i mean i think you know we talk here quite a lot about when things fuck up it's recognizing that you've got it wrong recognizing your failures and learning and changing it um or did that just come as before you even sat up, you sat down and went, this is how I want to build it? No, I think that's totally been by accident, just based on I see it that I treat my team how I would have liked to have been treated. Mm. So, I mean, we have our ups and downs, and don't get me wrong, while I've got a member of my team that's been with me 23 years, I've had some members of our team that haven't lasted six months. So it, it's, it's definitely an ongoing process i think the shortest member the newest i suppose members of the team now have both been there five years because we haven't taken anyone on since covid we've just this year we've lost two members of our team one has decided that he doesn't want to be a barber anymore and the other one's gone on to open his own business so i left somewhere i'm not prepared to stand in anyone's way to stop them doing that and that's i wouldn't say necessarily natural progression but some of us want to do that and mm. some of us don't. And I think it's about making sure I'm looking after the people that want to mm. stay. And your team are, are, are enthusiastic about being trained? Is it, do you get any resistance from you know, anyone who's been there a long time that, or do they get involved in training others? A bit of both. Um, I find some of the older ones there, I say, older, aren't really up to being at all the shows anymore or... Um, going away on lots of education. But everyone's happy. I insist everyone does at least four days a year off-site education. Right. And in fairness, if you can't give us four days and you don't want to improve yourself with four days, then... It's a bit of a red flag going on there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think definitely think mm. so. But obviously another big bit of, of what you do is away from your shop where you are going off running education for other people, running training programs for other people and and putting collections together. Um, how'd you get into that? Where did that come from? What well, drove you out of the salon and to stand behind someone else's chair? That was really interesting because um, 
again, you've got to go back 20 years now. I'm in my 20th year of being an American Crew All-Star. So 20 years ago, American Crew broke into the UK. Um, my rep at the time knew I'd been a college educator, knew I'd done um, competition work for quite a number of years. And this is all pre-social media. So she knew I had a bit of a name for myself and said they were looking at expanding the American crew team into the UK. Was it something I'd be interested in? So I took part in the trial. I did the two, got through the first trial and then got through the second trial. And then before I knew it, I was on a plane to San Diego. I spent 10 days in San Diego where the academy was for American crew at the time. Um, and they retrained me in how they wanted me to work. And it was a philosophy that I really appreciated. I've really, um, at that point, I've been using the product for about three or four years. And it was something that I really found a kinship to. And then over time, I've developed, I've done, two weeks ago, I was in Serbia, cutting hair on stage in front of a thousand people and um, doing a runway show, catwalk show with the latest collection which is, as I said to you before, is ACID, acid, nice play on words. Um, but then one of the things that I think really drove me to stay in with that program was I like to see the change in people. So we get advanced hairdressers and barbers that come to the academy and spend two and three days with us at the academy. And we can see change in how they look at head shape and mm. we kind of take it a bit further. Our core basics, well, we find the basics, people find really hard. You know, we don't use any thin inch shears. We just use a standard six and a half inch scissor. We use a feather razor and we use a motor driven clipper. And that's what we do to create all our shapes. But we have a real kind of philosophy, a method, structure of how we work. and. It's not for everybody, but I think it gives a really well balanced approach to complement yeah. it. And so the people that are coming do tend to be fully fledged barbers. They're already yeah. working and looking to looking yeah. to gain something definitely. new. Yeah. And come away with something. Yeah, definitely. And do you think I mean talking to a lot of barbershop owners, they don't have that kind of access to training or they're not looking for access to training or they're not doing any training. A lot of them, you know, I mean, somewhere between 70 and 90% of our industry are self-employed. Uh, certainly city-wise, they're generally chair rentals. Um, how are we going to encourage those people, those running their own, essentially trying to run their own little businesses within a business to, to attack training, to get training and how to encourage them to, how important that is for them? Or is I, it? I think... It's very easy to sit here and say that everybody needs education. That said, I think where an awful lot of people back off from education is by learning something new, it potentially says that what you were doing was wrong. Now, my view of education has always been it's an exchange of ideas. You're already a haircutting professional, whether that's a barber or a hairdresser, whether you're self-employed or whether you're part mm. of a team. So people are actually paying you for services that you are delivering. So why don't you try and improve that by adding to your own skill repertoire? That's one of the things that I always try to portray with whether it's my team that don't really feel like they need any more education or whether it's somebody like meeting you today. It It's definitely about how you can... Stand behind the chair for 45 hours a week. You can do the same thing day in, day out. But at what point do you start getting a little bit demotivated, mm. a little bit fed up, a break in the norm? And sometimes you might go on five classes. You might mm. not like any of them. Or you might take a nugget of information out of each one of them that just helps inspire you that little bit more. And that's if, what's always interesting. If you're me. behind the chair running your business, you're taking you know five, six haircuts out of your pay packet to buy a course where are you going to find you know you you obviously spend a lot more time looking at courses and being involved with the you know the production and creation of those courses how as a you know a working barber if i'm going to go right i'm going to spend what would i be looking at spending well you can spend anywhere from i think 
in the region of about 150 pounds to 600 pounds and that's not just on american career education that's looking through walls artistic brochures and and other manufacturers and so when you're doing because you've got like you know your team have you that you're helping them decide and sometimes like you say it's quite hard to kind of look inside yourself and go like my scissor works good but my clippering is shit and it's quite hard to kind of admit that sometimes i think our industry does keep out a bit of bravado so you know if you if you're a working barber on, a, on your own chair rental how would you how would you encourage them to look at what their school base is missing how how would they find I think, to I bring think, that skill back and improve their column. I think one of the things that happens without you even really realizing it is as trends change, mm. even if it's only slightly. For the last five to ten years, comfortably, we've been skinning the sides of men's yep. heads. And we went from not skinning the sides of men's heads to trying to work fades in mm. that people couldn't do. So initially, people had to learn how to do that. Now my argument is, as hair's starting to get longer, and I, I agree, not everywhere, and I agree it's not for everyone, but if you want to challenge yourself to be on the crest of that wave, given that we're such a trend oriented industry, mm. then if you don't educate yourself, whether that's on social media platforms, watching videos on YouTube, whether that's looking at things that pop up on Instagram, if you don't get in there and get your hands dirty, how are mm. you going to evolve yourself? Mm. I mean, we're really seeing long hair change. And I think even, you know, I mean, I know we're back from COVID a couple of years, but during that lockdown, everyone got a bit comfortable about not having their hair cut. We had lots of guys that suddenly had very long hair and, and really wanted to keep it. Um, and, you know, thankfully we've got guys that are good with scissors and good with long hair and, and we made that transition through. But, you know, again, if you pick up brochures while they're still a very heavy lean towards clipper courses has anyone caught up are you seeing many more longer hair courses and the encouragement of actually putting the clipper down and using a using a pair of scissors yeah the, there's a lot of um seems to be a lot of newer companies that aren't necessarily brands as in product brands offering education there's a lot of small independent businesses growing businesses the likes of Menspire, you know, they offer certain, I think, very editorial looking yeah. education. But an awful lot of their education as a company isn't necessarily clipper driven. Josh OP, that's another name that's out there that is trying to push and promote education that isn't necessarily clipper led. Mm. So as well as American Cruise education, there are other education platforms available and growing, I think. And as time is rolling on, I do think that the there is more people looking for education. I just I don't disagree how they access it mm. and how they find it. I mean, you, you. I mean, presumably, most, a lot of what you you're doing now is in person training. Um, were you doing online stuff during COVID? Do you put some of your training on YouTube? Do you do stuff that people can access? We didn't put it on YouTube necessarily, but what we did do was we invited core clients of American Crew to come to webinars where we hosted look and learn classes. And that was... Did that work? The, I mean, uh, you saw after that, there was a lot of people jumping on, a lot of board hairdressers and barbers starting to do a bit of haircutting courses on, on webinars themselves. Does it work? Uh, I, I found, I thought it was brilliant. We, the way it worked, my um, manager at the time was hosting the whole thing via his house where he lived down in Herefordshire. And then I was in my salon with my iPhone and everything come to me. So <laughs> yeah. I, I had him in my ears while you were watching me cutting hair and questions were being posted to him and then I was talking the questions through. So the whole thing was really interactive mm. and towards the end of it, I definitely think that we we were reaching audiences of 80 to 100 plus a time 
And, and was this paid for or is this free, was this no, free, free access? It was free access. And are you seeing, is that still going on with other people or is it, no. now, is it now in person or charged for access? Yeah, I think it's now a lot more in person. I think there's, there's a lot of things you can watch but from interactive... It's not interactive it, in the same way. It's not interactive. It doesn't seem to be in the same way. And for American Crew, it was the reason behind it was to stay in tune with their core yeah, customers and to keep yeah. the brand alive with them, even though mm. we weren't working. So you said earlier, I think that, you know, the fact of trend is, a, is quite a new thing for certainly kind of longer running barbers. When you think of that kind of traditional barber, you know, the short back and sides and a bit of clipper work tended to be, you know, the very strong part of the older barbering. And then I guess really we've seen a big change. I think I'd probably say over the last kind of 10, 15 years, you've seen this re-emergence of, of, of a more fashion-based barbershop and even the traditional barbershops becoming more fashion-based. But you've got trends and guys are suddenly very fashion aware where they weren't particularly bothered. Um, you've done your training. Do you find your staff, are you managing to stay ahead of the curve? So you're making sure your staff are ready for cut, longer cuts. When fades and clipper work suddenly came in, you know, was that, were you ready for it? Or are you, were you playing catch up yourself? Bear in mind, we're, we're keeping ourselves straightforward and honest here that we're not always, ah. we're not always right about everything. I think, <laughs> I think where we were lucky was, um, if rewind the clock to kind of the barbershop becoming in vogue again mm. and everyone was starting to go for kind of skin fades with pompadours and beards were starting to grow. Yep. I was very fortunate that we did a show in Chicago in 2008 for American Crew and we were gluing beards to guys' faces. <laughs> well, now, yeah, I didn't yeah. really see the beard thing coming on, but we were gluing beards to... Um, guys' faces, and we were skinning the sides of hair, not necessarily with the level of transition that you see now, because the whole segment for that show was called Jeremiah. So it was kind of think Western cowboy esque, where they're shaving their own, you know, real old school barbering. Yeah. And we were sticking beards on lads' faces just kind of to make the segment work. And before we knew it, we started to do that. In, in the store. In the shop. That said, I never seen the beard coming. I really didn't. Yeah. And beard education was one of the hardest things that I found we had to evolve to. Because mm. we'd always run clippers over people's faces. But I know, when the shapes start- and, so, and the, the beards. I mean, we've got proper beard loyalty amongst ours that they'll definitely wait. If someone's on holiday, they're waiting. They're not. Yeah. Yeah, they're much more... Uh, structured about their beard than anything else and did all of yours get to that I mean do you I mean you know where you are in Liverpool there's a you know hugely strong fashion trend um, yeah beard, beard the hipster kind of yeah. bearded vibe definitely took off and as I say I think we were while we were keen with the aggressiveness of the sides and back of people's hair it took us a while to grasp beard education mm. and then look at product availability for that area of our business because in fairness since day one i've always been strong in retail and and having product lines within my shops Mm -hmm. so um even some of the big manufacturers like american crew that i've worked for for 20 years initially we were gluing beards on people's faces but we didn't have anything to support from a product line Mm -hmm. it took a couple of years for that to develop So I mean, it's not a hair care range out there that's not got a skin care and a beard care with it. Now, I mean, so moving on to a bit of product, I guess, that seems kind of where we're heading. That, and I'm constantly reading that, you know, the men's, men's hair care and skin care is this billion pound industry. Um, but, you know, I wander along and speak and see a lot of shops that have got maybe half a dozen cans of different waxes and pomades and clays in their window and the more i speak to most are like well we don't retail very much it's not a big part how have you made yours and again was that something that was part of your ethos did you did you cock it up and get it right did you did it grow if you're managing to make retail work 
I don't. How'd I, you do that? <laughs> I, I, I don't think it's a case of it. It just works. I think it's something that you have to work on and have to work at. It's definitely not something that you can just put on a shelf and expect it to walk out the door. And going back to what you were saying before, in and around how an awful lot of businesses you see now are all self-employed, I think that makes it very difficult for retail to exist mm. in a shop and exist well, because the argument there is who owns it. So unless you have a five chair shop with five different lines of product and each barber owns their own product, I think that is hard in itself. But going back to making our clients look and feel great is my paramount of how retail ended up on our shelves because we use everything that we recommend. I don't believe in hard sell. I never have believed in hard sell. If we use something, it's there because you've seen us use it. If you want it, you can have it. If you don't, then you don't, mm. that's fine. But what we find is the more we use the same things on our clients to get a certain look, when they go away and they can't do it, they come back mm. and say, what did you use? And do you find those, you've got some staff that are maybe more naturally enthusiastic about, you know, I've said, I've certain I could off the top of my head, I can think of a couple of fellas that, that just when they get a product, they get so excited about it that they want to use it and, and they're not selling it at all, but the kind of enthusiasm for it makes clients want to take it with them. And I think that's the key. That's the key element is keeping your staff excited and your team excited mm. about product. And, Again, I suppose it's hand and glove. The way I look at how I keep my staff excited about product is through them going and learn on training courses. They go mm. and learn a new collection. There's a different product story for each haircut that goes with that mm. service. And then they come back and go, oh, well, I haven't used this for a while or I haven't used that for a while. And that then enables them to get a little bit more mm. excited about it and puts it back front and center and I think that that's one of the key things. I mean, we do a brief sheet every week. And in that brief sheet that my team read every Monday morning, we have a five-minute huddle meeting where the brief sheet's read. And we have a base product. We have a styling product. We have a finishing product. And we have a skin product, whether that's beard, whether that's moisturizer, whether that's the shaving product of the week. And those key products are for when you get somebody that new or when you get somebody that doesn't really use anything that we stock, then you can perhaps use one of those products and it's all incentivized as well. Mm -hmm. So it helps. You've got to, I believe you've got to put focus mm -hmm. into your team and they've got to see the benefit for it. So when you say incentivize, yep. um, with our belief of pure honesty here, how, how successful is it when you're trying to get your team how do you? How are you incentivizing? Well, on, on re, is it on retail sales or is it target or is it part of their salary? It's target driven and it's um, based in and around service and retail combined. I've never believed in giving anyone a pound for a product, anything that lame. Because yep. at the end of the day, you, you can sell a unit of product and get a pound. Well, wow, that yeah. was that was worth it. Not. So I'm very much a believer in that we throw it all in the hat. Everybody has their set salary. Everyone has a commission structure that they can work to. And we build from that. We throw daft things in there as well. So it might be that, you know, somebody reaches a number of retail that they haven't done before. I might pay for them to go and have dinner with the partner somewhere and it doesn't necessarily mean they're selling 100 products a week it might be a case of somebody that whose retail hasn't been that great over a month mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden they have a good week well i might do something daft for them yeah. just just so they feel like there's a good round of applause and it's noticed and recognized yeah. and and i think i think that's the thing you don't necessarily always have to make everything add up in terms of Yes, we all want profitable businesses, but sometimes I think you've got to incentivize your team in such a way that if it costs you a little mm. in the short term, 
then it makes you more in the long term. And that's kind of, as I say, my haphazard approach to running and building my team has always been trial and error. We have a thing now where each member of staff can give away up to three products a week. So you come in looking like you're having a bad day. There you go, fella, have a bottle of shampoo. And lo and behold, that bottle of shampoo might turn into a client that is actively yeah. purchasing product. Now you can say, well, why do you want to give a bottle of shampoo away? Well, I don't really. I'm valuing my client. Mm. None of my team pay for product. I want them all using the products that we sell. Yeah. So as long as you give me the empty bottle back, you can then take, whether it's a shampoo, whether it's a body okay. wash, whether... And I do, I want the empties back mm. just to prove that you're not giving it to John down yeah. the road and Sheila up the... But again, I guess it's coming back to that whole that whole factor that our industry is, that the client is the kind of key to everything. That if you've got someone sitting in your chair, um, you want to make them feel as special as possible. You want to make them sure that their hair's on trend, that you can do what you're asking. You know, I think inherently we're, you know, we want to please. We want people to be... Um, you know, feel good. And so, you know, whether it's training, whether it's product, these are all part and parcel of of getting that client's kind of needs covered. But I think somewhere where we lo- we lose it is as business owners, and I'm a business owner as well as an educator, I think we don't appreciate that our immediate clients are our team. Mm. If we're not looking after our team and we're not making our team feel good, whether that's feeling wanted, whether that's, given support when they need support, whether that's educating them to feel as though their confidence is at the highest level, then they're never going to pass that on to our Mm. customers. And I think sometimes we expect they should just deliver. And unfortunately, life's not Mm. like that anymore. Mm. It's definitely changed in the last 30 years that I've been part of this industry. And I think now more than ever, we have to pay them correctly. We have to give them the time off that they need. We have to make them feel good about coming to where they work so that they can be proud of it to then allow them to give that level of service to a yeah. client. Yeah, no, definitely. So, and then, you know, you've got your collection that you've been working with, Acid. Yeah. How have you, how do you approach that? How are you putting a collection together? So I'm fortunate in the fact that um, the artistic team of a higher level of a technical director an artistic director and a global education director and they sit on or above trend and they tend to design a lot of the trend and a lot of the collection for american crew and then over the years i've so acid is the american crew collection of 2023 over the years i've then learned how to pick some of that out and with my own team we then do our own collections Mm. of hair and photo shoots to inspire them but from an educational standpoint i always take my lead from the artistic directive from and what do you do with your imagery this is something i'm really always quite fascinated by i speak to quite a lot of young barbers who want to create imagery i mean you know yeah, we're all definitely submerged into social media and, and wanting this kind of celebrity status that they want to create. Now, you know, it's all well and good doing haircuts, putting a little lamp on, taking some pictures of your client and that kind of stuff. How do you elevate that to, you know, studio, making imagery, having an image? How are you putting that together? And what sort of costs are you talking about to, to, to have a, I guess, your own kind of store collection? So one of the things we're not great at, which probably will go down really poorly in this environment, is our social media following is terrible because we don't do anything with social media. We're really poor at social media. And I have a lot of young guys that work for me who are never off social media, but never put anything on social media, which is hilarious in itself. But the store, presumably, is your store. If your store was quieter and you needed a bit of business, it might be. Yeah, it, it might, might move up. Your, it might move up your it, your it scoreboard. <laughs> but one one of the things that we do is that we do shoots hmm. and we do them for competitions mainly, and it might be something like the Modern Barber Awards. It might be something like the Raw Talent competition that's just been just been done um, 
which in fairness we didn't have any entries for because I was one of the judges. But we look, I look and say, okay, might be Sam. Sam, what would you like to get out of this year? Well, I wouldn't mind doing some photographic work. Okay, get me a course. And then we'll look at running by um, how we put that together. And studios aren't really that difficult to put into play. We always use our salon. And we have a photographer that has graduated in photography at Liverpool University. We were fortunate that he was one of our clients. So over time, he's always done our shooting. And then it's evolved that way. Personally, I have a close friend of mine who does all my photography. And I'm fortunate with that aesthetic that he does mine. So from a cost point of view, we're lucky in some respect that the photographers that we use are quite reasonable to us. The hardest problem is always models. And I think that getting a great model is something that needs a lot of work. And I'd always recommend using model agencies if, but making sure they allow you to cut their hair. Otherwise don't entertain paying them now. But what are you spending on something like that? I, so, I mean, if I, if we, if we were going to do a set of pictures for a competition, what would you, what would you allocate as a budget? If, even if you're using your mate's rates and your buddy's photographer and all that kind of stuff, there's still a, there's still a cost to it. And I'm always, spe- I, I'm always speaking to people who really are interested as to how they fund something like that. I, the most expensive one I've done was 5,000 pound. The cheapest one I've done was 700 750 quid and all went through the competition line um yeah, yeah well did the five grand do better than the 700 quid <laughs> um no because we never we, we never won any of them no um <laughs> but, but do you justify that spend in another way i mean you know you win an award it looks good in the window do you find that brings in customers brings in staff makes staff feel good I, Where again does... I, I go back to making your team feel great mm. the buzz around making you the buzz around the photo shoot and the team that are selected to do it that want to be part of it because not everyone wants to do it and I think when you're doing something like that you've got to have people that really want to do it but the buzz in and around it in itself even if it's just to create them a portfolio so they're not going to do anything with it mm. that in itself brings a wealth of joy and I just think that if you can you've got to go back to structuring your business right you've got to you've got to decide that you're going to structure that into into your yearly cost because for me to pull five thousand pounds out fresh air to just do a photo shoot mm. my accountant just for, die on the desk yeah so at the start of a year I'll say to him look I want to budget in where do you think my figures need to be for us to do this mm-hmm. And it might be a case of we say, right, we want five thousand pounds worth of retail this year to pay for that to photo shoot. Yeah, and that's. But you'd start the year with that in mind. That's yeah. not something. Again, one of your staff turns around halfway through the year and says, "Oh, I really fancy being a bit of a celebrity. Can we do? Can we do a nice photo shoot?" No, that that's something that now already this year I did mine for the most wanted awards this year, and straight after that. That was in March. And straight after that, I've already been thinking about next year. So the team mightn't suggest photo shoots. That might be just my thing. Okay. But while it's my thing, it's inclusive. There's always enough in the team that are interested and yeah. and wanting to. So if they don't bring it up, mm. I'll always bring somebody along with me. And that, I think, is oh. more to How happy were you with this year's Most Wanted, your your collection? I was really happy with my collection. Um and I was up against some absolutely amazing talent. Because it was really, it seemed like a big, big avalanche of applications this year. It definitely seemed like the biggest. Yeah. Um, and it was, the, to be fair, it was the first year I'd gone for the men's hair specialist. So I wasn't overly shocked that I didn't make the final three, but the final three were absolutely epic. Mm. So um, credit to them and Chris Foster won his award and he deserves every accolade that the guy gets. But it that didn't put me off because one of the things that you get from the most wanted awards is you really get good feedback. 
So it gives you something for the for the following yeah, year. Hence, I'm already you're already on it and already thinking about it. Beautiful. Well, mate, I think that that feels like we've covered education Brilliant. brilliantly. Um, I'll certainly be keeping an eye out for the Acid Collection and for your next year awards and stuff. And really lovely to to sit and talk to you. Great. Thanks. Nice Buddy, to meet you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you for watching this episode of The Noble Barber. If you liked it, please do like and subscribe. If you've got comments of what we should be doing in future, please give us your questions and we'll try and find an expert to talk to. Or if you're the expert and you want to come on here and help stay in touch, we'll get you on. Come and join us on the sofa.